Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final panel of the Comic Card Conference. Uh, I'm Kate Clancy, and I'm one of the organizers of the CAC. If this is your first time joining us, you might find that our programming is a little bit different from what you might find in other rooms at the con. Uh, we are the academic track of programming here at WonderCon and also at Comic Con International in San Diego. So we have a tendency to go a little bit more in depth um, than some of the other programming might into the kind of mechanics of the medium um, that we're talking about. Uh, sadly, this is our last panel, as I said, um, so if you're just joining us, you missed all the awesomeness. Um, but we do have programs, should be still some on the table in the back, and we'll let you know what you missed. Uh, also on the back of these programs is our contact information. If you'd like to get involved in the CAC, if you'd like to you know, submit for a presentation, um, you'll find our website and our email on the back of this program. Uh, this panel consists of three individual presentations of about 20 minutes each. If you guys could save questions for the end, we'll take all the questions once all three presentations are done. And also if you could silence your cell phones, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, so I will be presenting on this panel as well as Christopher Sperando from Rice University. But first up is Sydney Hepler from the University of Oxford. Is that your name? Sorry. <laughs> Hello, so as she said, I'm Sydney Hepler. I'm from the University of Oxford. I'm going to talk to you about romance comic books, the Cold War, anti-feminism, and teaching women their place. Um, I came into the comic book history in my undergraduate at Community College at Los Angeles Mission College in Southern California. I was trying to find a topic that would impress my professor and I stumbled across romance comic books somehow. And um, I actually thought they were a joke. I didn't think they were real. I thought they were making fun of 1950s culture. And then I found out that this was, they're the best-selling comic book of their time. And they're created by Simon and Kirby, who also created Captain America. So they were kind of a big deal. And they actually outsold Captain America and what they're talked about. And I thought that's strange, so I decided to talk about them. And I continued my research into my honor thesis at UC Davis and now at Oxford. So they're pretty much my life, much to my parents' horror. Um, they're pretty on board now that I'm at Oxford, but that's about it. So women's comic books were created by Simon and Kirby, who you see there in the middle. Um, they also create Captain America. I don't really like referencing that because I feel like it privileges male comic books over female comic books, but I want to, I feel like it's a good reference point just for the purpose of this talk, but I actually think romance comic books are much more fun sometimes than Captain America, and I hope you agree. But um, they created them in 1947 because they noticed that a lot of young women were reading comics, but they didn't have any specifically geared towards them. And they noticed also that a lot of young women were reading True Confessions, the confession magazine, so they thought, Maybe this would make a great comic book and a great visual narrative, and they were correct. It did. It's a lot of fun. Um, but before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about some influence on these comic books, which is that they were influenced by government intention. So True Confessions, they modeled it after, was long influenced by the government. Um, the, they became concerned about some of the plot lines that appeared in the confession magazines and wanted to incorporate more wholesome messages for teenage girls. And also, in 1942, the Writers of War Board was established, and what the Writers of War Board did was it influenced plot lines in novels, movies, comic books, and confession magazines to get people to support the war, and then to get them to ease, tr transition out of the war at the end. And comic books, of course, as I said, were under it, including Captain America. And I don't know, I haven't found any evidence that Young Romance was directly influenced by this, but I just want you to get an idea of the kind of culture that it came out of. And so what was happening is these comic books are trying to sort of say, that, okay, the war's over, let's get back to the home life, be good mother, be good wife. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the main themes that appear or subsections that appeared in these comic books and talk about what they addressed and what sort of historical narratives they were drawing from. So although I said that this is like just take a moment to like enjoy those images, but although I said that so there was a big push for domesticity. This brought up some really interesting concerns over teenage girls because they were buying a little bit too much into the propaganda of the time. And they, um, from ages 13 to 18, they started going steady instead of dating around. And so that meant they picked one guy and date him exclusively and treat him as a potential husband, which led to a lot of issues, such as a lot of premarital sex, which was happening. And also they started acting as quasi-adults and also getting married a lot younger. And at this time, marriage was really the woman's way to become a citizen in society. And so you had these civil forms of women now who are able to make decisions as citizens to hurt America. And not only were they 
like ill-formed adults, but they were also buying into consumerism in a way that their parents weren't, such as comic books, so they were like ill-informed as well as not really fully formed adults. And so the way that the comic book industry addressed this was through teenage romance concepts. And how they did this is they have plot lines where girls who kiss too much ruin their lives. And yeah, this, yeah. And then teenage girls who got married too young, and I thought this was actually pretty boring. Teenage girls got married too young, consummated the marriage, realized they were too young, annulled the marriage, and then ruined their lives. And the way to fix this was through male domination or for, through father figures. And this was reflecting a really interesting psychological discourse at the time, where psychologists were saying basically that to handle a teenage girl is to sort of do a gender reverse Oedipal complex where the father would act in certain ways and get certain psychological cues to get teenage daughters wanting sexual approval from their father. So you get the, like, if you think about movies where daughters are coming down the stairs and they're pretty prom dresses, and the father's like, oh, yes, that's beautiful, I'm gonna cry now. And so it's kind of like the approval that they're seeking. And then by the time that they were ready to marry, the father would be able to hand them off to their new um, groomer, their husband. And so you really get these in plot lines, such as I was the only a girl in school, where she's miserable because she's too bossy and she needs a man who can boss her around. And by the end, she finds one, and she's very happy. And then you get this interesting public service announcement comic strip from Charlotte and Comics that ran throughout the 50s, where Janice's date cancels on her because he's sick. So the father is like, I'll be your date, and he's perfect. He brings her flowers, he puts her friends are impressed, they do the dance contest, they win, he gets her home early. Pop, you're the greatest. <laughs> Remember, gals, your pop is your past. This is presented as a shout in public service, so it's like really kind of creepy. Fun, but creepy. So moving on to marriage and motherhood. At this time, as I said, domesticity was really pushed forward, and this for two main reasons. One was that women, when women were brought into work in the war, the government and industry didn't really want them there. It was a last-ditch effort. It was like, okay, we really need these women now. I guess we really do have to bring them into work. And um, I just want to point out, this is for white women only. African-American women have been working for forever, because they had to. Um, but so there was that reason. And then so they really wanted women back in the home. It's like, okay, we don't need any more. Please go back. And then also there was a fear of communism, which is very much linked to sex during this time. And it was believed that women could fix that by keeping a very happy home and keeping their husbands happy. So you had to be sexually satisfying, but not too sexually satisfying, because else you'd become perverted and a communist. And also you had to raise your sons very well, but not be too motherly, because then you make them wimp and communists. They weren't supposed to like do anything for their daughters, except for keep a happy home, because they could corrupt their daughters. That was the father's job. And so in plot lines and comics, you actually get a lot of this. You get um, husbands who cheat on their wives, and then leave, and then the wives get upset and realize that they did something wrong. There was actually one advice article in a young love, I think it was, that was like, um, I, is your waist skinny enough? Are you keeping a clean house? Are your children crying a lot? Like, what's going on? What have you done wrong? And so, you also just get like a lot of fun things, like how to make him propose. My sister recently got engaged, and I kept posting these things on her timeline, asking if this is what she did, and she said no, so don't follow the advice. And, um, oh, this is like a really funny one, just about like how to keep your man happy and she gets plastic surgery. And she says, well, when do you think you can love me now? And he's like, that depends on whether the plastic surgery has remodeled your attitude as well as your face. <laughs> and that was like, oh, whoa. And then we get love customs. So we have fun little articles like about marriage to get you to thinking about marriage. And what I found the most disturbing is the auction marriage, about when marriages these women used to be auctioned off, and that may seem strange, but it was actually great, because then every girl was guaranteed to get a husband. And then we have this one, where she, she goes, I don't know, they just get married, and she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do without you now that we're not on the honeymoon, what do I do all day? And she's like, well, you can get used to being a kitchen slave. And she gets really excited. He leaves and she dusts the house all day. And then you find out she's really bad with money, which someone else has to correct. Okay, so career and the working woman. So at this time, of course, as you can probably guess, career women were vilified for reasons that I've already explained. And this is one of the few plot lines, besides the teenagers who get married and then annul their marriage, where the wives can actually be permanently ruined. Because, and 
I just want to make a few points that it was okay to work if you weren't yet married and you're waiting for a husband, and it was okay to work if you're waiting for a baby and you needed the money, and it was okay to work if your children were off to school and you didn't want to get bored and start clinging on to your husband and aggravating him, but it was never okay to work for your own enjoyment, and it was never okay to pursue a career unless it was in nursing because America had a really big shortage of nurses at this time, and so that was presented as like an extension of the mother role, so it was okay, which I think is kind of hilarious because we're very anti-communist at this time. But, um, so you get this in comic books where she says, I think really like, I own my selfish interest, almost ruined my life, and gives up her career and gets married to that guy. And then this love was to be my sacrifice where she wants to be married, but then her mother and sister won't let her, and so she says bye to them and gets married, lives happily ever after, and then don't. And then this really hilarious article um, where this guy got really mad about career women. And I think he was, like, he was mad at his wife because he says, the girl who takes her work too seriously, who dresses only in severely tailored clothes, who continually orders others about, and who talks in a like formal, cold voice, her mobile face, devoid of future, no, sorry, devoid of all feeling is greatly harming herself. In her future, she runs the risk of carrying the hustle and the bustle of her workday existence into her private life of being too demanding, too managing, and too insistent on running everything her way. <laughs> okay, and then to my last little slide collection, which is my favorite, and I think the most accurate thing about romance comic books is that every girl who misbehaves is in a red dress. <laughs> I'm wearing one, that's the joke. <laughs> so we have the friend of me and Moral, where she's getting ready to go out with this horrible guy, so she's going to put on a red dress. We have this girl who got married, consummated the marriage, and old and that's her father, by the way. And um, so she's just in a red dress the entire comic strip. We have um, the Hitler Youth later, who's not, because her friend is falling in love with America, an American, and is going to move to America and be like a good moral citizen. And so she's like really angry about it, and so she's a Nazi, so she's in a red dress. And we have Diamond Dance Girl who um, uses men, and I like it, like, they slip through your fingers just like easily as money you earn, and so she's in a red dress. And then the girl who steals her, uh, tries to steal her best friend's boyfriend to marry him, and fails, and it's like, my only crime was love, and anyway, so she's in a red dress. <laughs> and my favorite, then, man hater, she hates men, so she has to be in a red dress, and she uses them, and I just, I just love this particular drawing as well. Beautiful. Anyway. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you.